this uh, October 13th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Uh, first thing you have to do is approve the agenda. So if the planning commissioners could take a look at the agenda, Mike's in around. Uh, and when you're ready, we'll take a motion to approve it. So if there's time at the end, Kirby, um, Marcella and John and I met last week, so we can give an update from the continuity instructors group. Uh, how much time do you think you'll need for that? Do you think we could squeeze it in under the comments from the chair or do you want to wait? Uh, we could just do a quick update. I think that's fine. Marcella, do you have thoughts? That's fine with me. Um, yeah, we can make it quick and then just send the example around and people can let us know if they have questions. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds good. So we'll, uh, we'll handle that shortly. Uh, first, we have to approve the agenda though. So moved. Okay, we have a motion from Stephanie. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Aaron. Okay, all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So with the agenda approved, we can proceed. Uh, and then the first item on the agenda is comments from the chair. Uh, I don't have um, any updates or anything, but uh, I would like to turn, uh, turn that over to Stephanie and Marcella to update us on the, uh, was it the continuity and structure working group? Um, to give us all all the other working groups some direction. So with that, go ahead, Stephanie and Marcella. Do you want to start, Marcella? You have the example, or I, don't, I can go. <clears throat> um, I am technically challenged tonight, so technologically challenged tonight. So I don't have a, I can't share the example, but um, yeah, I can start. So the, uh, the three of us met and talked about how we wanted to um create some structure for the different chapters going forward and we modeled it off of the um historic preservation chapter that we all sort of liked in terms of having um an, an aspiration and then goals under that and strategies under that and with each strategy we marked in that chapter um, who was responsible a relative cost and a relative priority. And we thought that that was a good model to use going forward. Um, and then John had already created like a Google site for us um, where we have, where we can house everything. And we started to put together these, um, <clears throat> I guess like a template um, thing <laughs> that will allow us to break down the goals and strategies and aspirations for each chapter in a way that will allow us to kind of look at things in a more simple way or sort of a more visual way um, so that we're not duplicating goals and strategies as we are kind of as they are written out in long narrative form. Um, and so we put together an example of that uh, that we can share and I think that that would be a good way for um the rest of the chapters going forward to look um what else am i forgetting stephanie we, we talked about a little bit about like outreach materials yeah we talked about doing the first initial outreach i think we ultimately decided that little surveys might not make the most sense but we'd like to get an idea from the public of how they would want to be engaged um so i think sending like a forward foreign post and just saying, hey, here's our update. We haven't drafted that yet, but I think we'll we'll draft that and send that around for your review. Um, and then the documents Marcella was talking about. So oh, forever ago, John created a Montpelier City Plan Google Drive sheet for us. So there's a plan website um, and then a bunch of folders um, that we can start using so that we can be sharing with each other more easily. I think we should, John put a lot of work into that at the beginning and it sort of fell off. So I think we'd like to get back to using that. Um, and then that's right. where we can start the, the examples like Marcel is talking about. Um, so that's the quick update. Any other, any questions for us or things that you wanted us to talk about that maybe we haven't yet? Uh, I think it sounds, I, th I think it sounds good. Thanks for following up on the outreach part. And that's going to be important. So it sounds like the next step is going to be a front porch forum post. Uh, and then we'll go from there. 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And um, John's not here to talk about it, but he had, he started to build up like a really basic survey that at some point we thought it might be a good idea to send out a really basic kind of like two question survey about that would really be more used as an interactive way to engage people and try to get people more, you know, get this on their radar. <clears throat> so we can share that too, when he's done with it. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, the only question I have is, did you did you talk about adding material like what like like would adding strategies within the pre existing goals be something that we consider as within the working groups scope? I th I think so. I think it's really um, one of the biggest pieces that we talked about is going to be that the narrowing process. So coming up with what are, we have a really long list from a lot of the groups. So I think a lot of it's going to be narrowing that down, talking to stakeholders and figuring out what's what's actually the most important that's actually going to be feasible. But yeah, if there's something missing, I absolutely think that should be within the working group's purview to, to add. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of the discussion for our first housing working group centered around whether we should be adding strategies to further flesh out these goals. Um, I thought it was appropriate, but Barb had other ideas. I mean, to the extent that, we, yeah, the group feels comfortable and has the knowledge of what kind of strategy could be added or, or who to reach out to to ask. But yeah, I mean, part of the breaking things up in the template document that we'll send around kind of helps make sure that there's it's a good way to look at it so that you see that there are strategies that support each goal that support the overall aspiration okay so we're all clear the working groups should try if, if your chapter is not already looking like the template then that's one thing we the, that we're expected to do then is to is to try to make our chapters look like these templates. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yep. And that'll also be a way, John's gonna set it up so that we can, each chapter has their own, but then they'll pull it into one larger document where it'll show all the strategies. Um, so we can use that as a, as a mechanism to better align them at the end. All right. Okay. That sounds great. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing uh, the template. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Stephanie or Marcella? Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, with that, we can move along. <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of um, folks waiting to discuss uh, the Savings Pasture Project. Hey, Before Kirk, you... me? Yeah, go ahead, Marcel. Sorry, I, I've got a quick, like, biz, like uh, business thing regarding the CDRPC meetings. Yep. First, I think I've got a duck out at 6.30 for that meeting tonight. Um, and then I was, I keep, and tell me if we should just do this offline or via email, but I need, to, I need help covering those meetings until February of next year. I've got some personal deadlines regarding my thesis that um, my master's degree that I need to, I'm trying to offload a little bit here. So I wanted to put that out to the group um, to get coverage for the next few months. For the CBRPC meetings? For the CBRPC meetings, yeah. Yeah, just email me. Okay. That's because I'm the alternate, so I would be the next person who would attend if you can, so. Okay, great. Yeah, just Thanks. email me and I'll, I'll try to get them on my calendar. Okay, thank you. To, to be clear, though, you're you you want to take like five to six months off? Um, just through February. So one, two, three, four. Yeah. If, if there's in, I mean, it sounds like we, if there's interest on the planning commission, we could get a replacement too, because. Um, yeah, I hate to dump all those on Mike. Um, also, I feel like we could probably just pass it around for a couple months and I don't think anybody would mind but <laughs> I don't know if that's legal <laughs> they wouldn't be able to vote on any items and they wouldn't count for quorum no, I can nothing. count for quorum as the as an alternate all right 
All right. Well, I'll talk to Mike about it. Maybe we can split them up. Uh, just offloading some of them would be helpful. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, Mike, let me know if you if you want to follow up, and we can get a replacement person so that you're not um, you know don't have all of those to go to. Okay. However you guys want to do it, though, I'll I'll follow along. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so before we can get to business, we have one other item, which is to uh, approve the minutes from last time. So if everyone can take a look at the minutes uh, that Mike sent out. Yeah, I did read them before, so I move approval of the minutes. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Ariel and a uh, second from Stephanie. All those in favor of approving the minutes from September 28th, if you're ready. Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, and it's approved. Uh, with that, we can get the business. It seems like we have um, a number of people here to discuss the Savings Pasture Project. I uh, First things first, uh, really appreciate everyone taking time to try to fill us in on some things. Uh, basically, we tried to discuss this without you last time, and we did all we could, but then we, you know, had a lot of unknowns that we wanted to go over. Uh, so uh, with that, um, if uh, everyone uh, associated with the project would introduce themselves, uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name is Dan Richardson. Uh, I've been retained as legal counsel for uh, Alan Goldman, um, who um, is one of the owners uh, or uh, to be of the Savings Pasture land. And I am David White, uh, President of White and Burke Real Estate Advisors. We are consultants to the city. So the city is our client on this project. D Doug, I think you're on mute. I could try to introduce myself if I'm coming through. Uh, you are? Go ahead. Hi, Alan Goldman, and I'm partners with Doug, and thank you very much for having us. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to uh, gather through Zoom. And Mr. Yes, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Doug Sorzy, as you can appreciate, uh, Alan and I have been informally meeting with both Bill Frazier and with David White's assistance, trying to conceptualize a preliminary uh, plan for the project. We're dealing with the riverfront area, the zoned area of the riverfront. Um, we do have some uh, PUD requirement comments. Um, Glad to uh, go through those now, or tell me which how you'd like to proceed, please. Um, well, our our thoughts were uh, we there were a couple of issues that we talked about last uh, meeting, and um, if Mike, are, are you able to help explain where we were with that? Um, maybe we could begin there, and then um, then it's the group. Mr. Zorzi or Alan or anyone has anything else to add that we can go from there? Um, yeah, so just to summarize what the last meeting, we did make some agreement on changes to the traffic standards in 3303. Um, I sent these to uh, Doug and Alan and uh, heard back that they were they were good with those. They're more than welcome to when when we get to comments if they have other concerns they can bring them up. But my understanding is that the changes we made to three three zero three on the traffic and three 
five, get the number right, 3504, that both of those changes were, were good, um, which left us with the outstanding questions on the plan unit development requirements. And what you and I had all discussed at the last meeting was the potential of changing the, they're, they're currently as written, required if you're doing more than a certain amount of development. Um, for example, in the new neighborhoods development, it's um, 40 units over a 10 year period or 40 parcels or 40 dwelling units over a 10 year period. So, um, you know, we had talked about, or I had proposed just striking the requirement, which would make the requirement go away. It sounds like in some um, conversations I had uh, with Alan this afternoon that perhaps it's it's not a matter of, of striking the entire applicability. Um, they don't mind going through it, but there are some specific provisions within that. If they have to go through it, there's some specific provisions within the PUD that they would like to see changed that they can't meet. So I think that is what Doug was going to be getting into is some of the specific pieces that are going to be tripping up their their project that they are looking at. Um, and just the last thing I'll say by way of introduction is this is um, a larger conversation. So we're all talking about specifically on the zoning piece. There's there's a greater conversation that David White and the city are working on, which involves all of the other public private partnership type pieces that the zoning isn't going to be dealing with, you know, things like, um, you know, are we having TIF and what would TIF pay for and all those types of things aren't zoning. Um, so what we're kind of focusing on here is going to be specifically what are the zoning rules that are um, going to trip up a project uh, that otherwise the city would want to support, but for whatever reason, the rules may get in the way. So we just want to make sure that the rules um, are what we want from a policy standpoint that we're going to be achieving our city goals from a policy standpoint while at the same time not putting so much of a barrier out there that it actually blocks the projects from happening so um i guess with that i can turn it over to kirby and i don't know if you want to just turn it over to, to doug to start giving his <coughs> comments okay uh yeah i mean just to make sure that we're clear so so we uh we we already approved a couple of changes last time yes. uh, that you know as a matter of policy we wanted to do uh, and then there were a couple of other changes that mike brought up that the planning commission uh wanted to find out more information before making a decision on so those those two things were uh and mike you may need to help me here to make sure i'm, I'm remembering this correctly one of them was to remove for new neighborhood pud's to, to remove the requirement that the PUD will apply if um, there's 40 units or more. That's one of them, right? And the other was, was the other one, the one under the conservation subdivision, conservation PUD, uh, and that's related to whether four parcels are being subdivided and over a 10 year period. Yes. So, uh, uh, so uh, Doug, if you could tell me if those are two things that are needed, and uh, while you're at it, a lot of our discussion last time was about you know a lot a lack of clarity about what this project will be. Um, so it's hard for us to to kind of know the context. So if you could help us with the context too, that would that would help. Uh, and with that, uh, go ahead. If we talk about context, um, we initially were looking at uh, both permitted and conditional uses and then started to immediately target traffic and the impact of traffic. Um, we attempted to engage the city um, over the past few months to pursue this um, issue of traffic and at this point we are pursuing just permitted uses um, we would like to pursue affordable housing affordable senior housing 
And um, with that in mind, if the city desires to proceed down that road of enabling some affordable senior housing, um, we do have some concerns with section 3404, um, specifically E, paren 2, there are several shells throughout the sections, um, but taking each one individually, um, on paren 2, we'd like to see the modification of shell to should for single and multi units. And also under E paren to paren A, eliminate that no more than 75% of the dwellings may be of the same type. Fully appreciate the goal of that requirement. Um, please appreciate that what we want to do is pursue affordable housing, do it in a larger building footprint size for obvious reasons, and to basically leave it at that. Um, the should would still have teeth, I believe. Um, it would be based on facts that remain to be discussed and presented. But um, we are asking for that modification of shell to should. If we have the same type of concerns for 3404F, sub or paren two, three and four, once again, modify the shall to should. We can discuss each one of those in detail if you'd like. Um, paren two basically reads buildings shall define the streetscape through the use of uniform setbacks along a build to line for each block. We have attempted to position the structures so that one does not look out one's condominium window and look into another building. We've orientated them so that there would be significant views. If we talk about paren three, buildings shall be located to the front of the parcels and relative to street, both functionally and visibly. Um, we, once again, when we turn the buildings slightly, the front of the street becomes a concern in reading the requirement. And specifically ask for your consideration. If we move on to 3404G, paren 5, um, it says with sidewalks, plural, and street trees. We would like to provide a development that could have one sidewalk instead of one up each side of the street. We'd like it to have a Murray Hill type concept or approach 
Um, maybe we can discuss some alternatives for a second sidewalk, whether it be connection to a uh, pedestrian path with an alternate route, but two sidewalks. I'm not sure if that's the best type of design. Um, and leave it for your consideration. If we go to 3404H, paren 2, Once again, same type of concern. Um, the front located to the street. Once again, we'd like to turn the buildings. That appears to be a limitation. If we talk about 3404I, paren 2, we're talking about garage doors, so to speak. We'd like to have underground parking where the first floor of the building would contain uh, parking. And it makes sense to have direct access to the building from the road and not to go around the back of the building, so to speak, um, therefore creating more impervious area and surfaces. And appreciate the fact that when we look at these regulations, they appear to be based on a flat topography. Appreciate the fact that the road's going to be at a, a depressed elevation, so to speak, and the developed area is going to be sitting uphill of that. The curb, so that the entrance to each structure would be above the curb cut elevation. And stop that at that point. Uh, if we look at 3404I, paren 3, once again, it says no parking permitted in the front of the building except a driveway serving a residence. Please appreciate that we need to have parking out front for ADA requirements and also emergency vehicle access. It would be very limited, but there appears to be a conflict at that point. So Doug, um, if, if I can interject here a little bit. Uh, Please. So, so these, are, these, these are all changes you're requesting related to the new neighborhood PUD. Correct. Uh, so, and and you know it, and there's there's quite a few of them so a few questions related to this then uh is it your objective to make this a new neighborhood pud because one thing we had discussed before was changing the uh the uh the new neighborhood pud so that maybe it doesn't apply to this project unless you would want it to so that's one question and another is uh I'm starting to see a vision, like uh, like a physical vision for what you have here based on these on these requests. So if you would uh, describe for all of us, like it sounds like you do have something concrete in mind. So if you would describe that for us, that would help too. So that's, so two parts, do you want the new neighborhood PUD and uh, will you describe what this is going to look like? I'm not sure about the new neighborhood PUD at this point. Would like to see a draft of those changes. 
um, before commenting further on it. If we're describing the development, we would basically access Berry Street from the proposed curb cut that um, has been designed by Dwarf Engineering. Uh, it would proceed to the upper uh, plateau of that riverfront district, and there would be basically buildings along each side of the road. Um, once again, road would be at a lower elevation than the building foundation. Um, I think what would be beneficial is at some point, if you could have the opportunity to see the footprint um, design that's been drafted to date. Um, that has been provided to the city manager and also to Mike. I would uh, urge Alan to give me some assistance here, um, not to basically expand upon what uh, is being proposed and uh, go from there. Doug, if I may interrupt David White here just for a moment. Um, I do have also a copy of uh, the plan and if you wanted and the chair and others were interested, it would allow me to screen share. I could screen share it and you could then walk them through that. Perfect. Thank you, David. Um, is if that I something? Actually, if, I, if I may speak first, I think that would help. Yes. Thank you, Alan. I didn't know if I'm recognized, Chair. I don't want to be out of order. Go ahead, Alan. I appreciate that. Well, it's hard because I know nobody can see me. This is a this is an interesting dynamic in paradigm we're all uh, in right now. So I, I wanted to expound a little bit on what you said and try to give a bit of the overview um, and quickly go through some of the points, and then it's not going to take too long. Um, as Doug was describing, it's a fantastic site and it's on a plateau, so we have to come on. We have to get across the Blanchard Brook put in the culvert. We would love to do affordable housing for seniors. And we really appreciate that you're addressing some of the traffic concerns because that was really holding us up. I know that Mr. White and Burke Associates would love to get more specifics, but it's been hard for us because we're not really sure where the boundaries begin and end, but we're doing our best. And so as we start to really look at this, like in the 75%, I wanted to explain that a, a little bit. If we, this is E2 parenthesis, you know, E parenthesis 2A. If we are to really have to change dwellings like that, we probably cannot achieve the number that people would like on that site or from what we've been told. If you take 40% of the parcel, which is still on the regs right now, that leaves us with, leaves us with about 11 acres to try to design the projects. Um, to try to hit a really large neighborhood project then with serving affordable seniors, um, we have to build uh, apartment style buildings or we just can't get that many units on the site. And so that was one of the difficulties with that. When we look at the site, it's really beautiful. It's not a flat piece as Doug described. It's a beautiful undulating piece of land that has pockets and it's big and there's shelves. So that's why the road is not really a geometric road. It is more of a biomorphic road following the contours going up the hill. It reminds me of a country road. That's why when Doug talked about the sidewalks, we were talking earlier together, should it have two sidewalks? That's typically an urban downtown design. Do we want two sidewalks? Do you want to maintain them? Um, I live on Terrace Street. We don't have two sidewalks on Terrace Street. We don't even have a sidewalk that goes from the bottom of my hill to the top of the hill. When I designed Crestview many years ago in 89, we designed a pedestrian bike path sidewalk that did not necessarily follow the road. It was looking in a different direction and letting you have a more country experience, not always looking over your shoulder, our cars coming. I was taught to ride uphill looking, facing the car so I would not be hit. So we're trying to address some of those things. 
and that's why Doug was talking about the sidewalks. We feel if you have two sidewalks going up that ro going up that road, one the impervious surface is increased, two the costs go way 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 up, and it looks like an urban environment going up the hill, and we're just not. That's just not what we're trying to create. In essence, because land needs to stay open and it will naturally, it's gonna. We're not going to be choosing the campus path, but it will look sort of like a campus because you can't really help it. It's not a flat piece of land. Um, and so you have to really put the buildings where they properly fit, keeping, as Doug said, the road at a lower elevation to keep drainage going correctly. And of course, you have to manage stormwater. So I want to talk about that. Um, and then it's interesting, buildings that face the front of a street. This will be a new road honoring Doug's family, so it'll be Asia Drive if you folks permit the project. And the buildings, of course, will have access and in some way face Asia Drive. But the real view and the dominance is the southwestern exposure of Barry Street enjoying what you have there. And so, of course, we would love to take advantage of that. And then that brings into question parking, parking in front, why we do want that or don't want that. I really do get it. But in some cases, it just doesn't make sense. So in our downtown urban one district, like state and Maine, I love it that our parking is out back and that our buildings come to the sidewalk. Um, in our case, we don't have any of those kinds of experiences. So the parking gets more, no pun intended, steered by the topography of the land. Where is it flatter? Where do you manage the water? Um, as Doug was saying, if the parking is behind the buildings, we actually have to create more impervious surface than maybe doing it towards the front where the road is coming in. And then I ask you as planning commissioners and of course as citizens, you know, we don't want to see certain things. We are blessed with such a large site and the ridge of the hill, unless you are far away, you probably won't see a lot of it. Um, and so am I trying to prevent people to see the cars from the train? I don't think that's it. And I don't think we're worried about River Street with 25,000 cars a day, or maybe it's more. Um, so that's why we're thinking, you know, why is that important? I understand maybe with the Shaw's or a downtown building, that might be very important. And we may change how things work, but we just didn't feel that that really fit that, fit that design of the site. And again, because it's not geometric, it's gonna be a biomorphic road, it's curving, it's a romantic road plan. Um, things can't always line up that way. Um, so I'm trying to go through the rest. Then, so that of course addresses the underground parking um, and oriented towards the street. We can always try to do that, but really we would rather design according to the site. And that's why Doug requesting uh, a bunch of the shalls changed to shoulds would really help and give you folks the chance in your judgment to decide where these things might be correct or they may not be correct. Um, okay, so so I have I have one clarifying question for you. Um, sure, sure, please. I, I was almost at the bottom of the list, and then I'm. I'm oh, go ahead. I, yes. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but I mean, I'm almost done. I just there's, there's, keep there's so many different uh, things to keep track of here. Uh, when you talk about sidewalks, um, mm -hmm. Alan, you mentioned okay, sidewalks on both sides might not make sense. Uh, are you, th you you are thinking of doing a sidewalk on one of the sides of the road going up from Berry Street, though? Yes, so. it's, a, it's under the PUD right now, it's a requirement that you do both, both sides. And so we're either proposing either one sidewalk or potentially even a pedestrian path that starts to move forward away from a sidewalk. Having sidewalks next to roads is not always the best thing. Sometimes you can have a beautiful pedestrian path that serves the same or both and gives you the same advantage. And when we did that at Crestview, we even designed that to be a second access point for fire access, that they could use a breakaway chain. But there was certainly chair, be at least one sidewalk, absolutely, or some way to get pedestrians up and down that meets ADA requirements. Okay, I'm, I, I'm not reading that, it, it says sidewalks plural, but I, I read that to mean, you know, sidewalks on different streets as it being plural and not, not as on each side of the street, but uh, that's going to be maybe something for for Mike later. Uh, uh, okay, so do, does any do any of the planning commissioners have questions about the specifics of the project and 
Good. Oh, Can I finish the last, the last, the, yeah, the yeah. last part? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And so then it's just it's just getting down to the 40%. Uh, the 40% is, um, I understand people are trying to protect rural land, and I, and, I, and I do appreciate that. I think there's a constitutional issue with the 40%, but that's another whole dialogue. My dialogue would be that in the wisdom of the city and the community, we have decided to make a riverfront area district with really permissive zoning. And we have some neat projects coming together. You know, we have Mr. Rubellini's, the Connors, Casey's, and ours. Um, and different people might face that. But why they would take 40% of the riverfront development is sort of a contradiction. Why would, it give, why would you give it so much potential to be able to do something and then take 40% away? And so that was also a strong concern. Um, it leaves us with just 11 acres, and again, it just whittles it down to um, a smaller parcel, and it, it's confusing. We're not really, we, we don't, it seems to be a contradiction for what the district is trying to do. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, for that last part, I can address oh, it partially. I, did, uh, I just want to say one last thing, too, before yeah. I forget. We really appreciate what you guys and ladies are doing. Um, we're doing proactive zoning instead of reactive zoning. Thank you very much. This is sure. really cool. So, so the, you know, I I, re, I remember some of the thought process that went into these PUDs when we were putting the zoning together, and uh, when we look at things like the forty percent on here, it was it was a give or take. Where if you're in a PUD, you're getting extra density. You get to you know the the rules are. are or flexed in your favor for some things, you get to put more units in potentially, but then the other side of it is, yeah, you keep this open space. So that's, I think, was meant to be the trade-off uh, and why the 40% is is justified. Um, but there is some question in my mind, I'm, and I'm aiming mean this at Mike and the planning commissioners really about, about the this being a requirement in some places. Uh, where I don't remember, you know, the PUDs intending to be requirements in our discussion before. Um, but with that, I, I would definitely want to ask Mike's thoughts about these individual requests uh, and and how he thinks, like, technically it could be addressed. But before that, maybe uh, if the planning commissioners have any questions for Doug or Alan, do we have any questions? It might be easier if we see also what Dave, Dave was going to show a little bit of the site plan. Right. Yeah. If that makes it easier for people to visualize the project. And I don't have to share the screen with you. You can just take it, David. Okay. If you'd like me to, I'm happy to. Give me just a moment. Yeah, I should have also said it. I wanted to thank Mike and White and Associates as well, White and Burke and Bill and all their folks. They've been working with us a lot and Stephanie to help us. Thank you very much, folks. All right, let me, here we go, okay. Bear with me just a moment. I will take it. And... Well, it's good to see what you look like, Dave. <laughs> All right. So there are two plans that um, I will share um, just to orient you. Can everybody see this screen? Yes. Okay, so this is the lower portion of the property um, where the cursor is, the hand moving, that's Berry Street. And then you can see a, uh, the, the conceptual access point fairly close to the western edge of the property um, and well west of where uh, the Blanchard Brook comes through, which is over here. And the idea is to bring the road up, and it is, as was described, it's following the contours of the land. This is, as you know, a hilly site. So I, want, I will come back to the screen, but I do want to show you um, this one. Uh, let me get it, sorry, down so you can see the plan. Um, here we go. Um, so this shows... Uh, the first plan I showed you is just this lower left corner here, the uh, southwestern portion of the property. This shows more of it. And site one was shown about where the cursor is here. Um, so it's on the west side of the brook, which is coming down through here. And there's where the brook crosses. And then the road um, 
is designed to follow the contours and to be able to have a reasonable grade to it. Um, and there's site one was down here, which showed on the other plan. And then you've got these other pads that have been identified as potential building locations with rough building uh, footprints. Um, and if I may take the liberty of explaining, and, and Alan or Doug, please correct me if I misunderstood you, but part of the challenge relative to the orientation of the building and location of parking is if you can visualize that this is going uphill, um, that means that these edges, the west and south edges, um, if are going to be, uh, uh, the parking would be underneath and you can't actually access the readily access that parking from the back side of the building because that's going to be probably another story above. If you look at the grades here where it's increasing um, 10 feet from this grade line to that grade line, you basically have your parking um, that you want to be able to come bring a driveway off and directly into that underground park, parking because you can't get access it from uphill because you're a whole floor above. Did I, Alan or Doug, accurately describe that? Perfect. Yes. Good. <laughs> Thank so, you. And I think what you have then is that the same kind of phenomenon with each one of these buildings uh, because of the topography basically dictates how they have to be laid out. Um, and it, it, certainly there is, you know, doesn't have to be precisely the way you see it here, but conceptually you're having to uh, deal with the reality so that you probably your first occupied level will be at grade. I'm guessing here, I've not seen architectural designs right now, but just I've been through enough over the course of my career, been involved in planning enough projects. Your, um, your first uh, uh, residentially occupied level will be accessed from uh, the uphill side and the parking from the downhill side. And so it, it, you really want your access to be able to come in pretty directly into these buildings in order for it to make sense with the parking underneath. And to the extent that there's not all the parking fits underneath, you then want to be able to have a contiguous exterior parking lot. Um, there may well be an entrance and need for, you know, I don't know how these can be laid out. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I did want to ask a clarifying question, if I may, um, of Alan and Doug, which is um, relative to the PUD, it, are there any uh, modifications to the zoning that are permitted by the PUD sections of the ordinance that you think are important for your project and therefore you would prefer to apply as a PUD? Or do you really do you believe you can build your project without being a PUD? If, if I may, Doug, um, because the Riverfront District offers such a large density, we believe that there's probably um, much greater potential than will ever be acceptable by the community. So we probably don't need a PUD in order to gain any density bonuses. You know, there's you can do hundreds. I don't even know if something like that would be acceptable. So am I correct then, given that, that from your perspective, if you're not required to apply as a PUD, if those two changes are made, the rest of these things are really not, a, not an, an issue for you because you would not be applying under that section of the ordinance and therefore this orientation of the building and so forth would not be, need to be changed for the purposes of your project. The Planning Commission may want to modify it for other purposes. I'm just trying to clarify that you would not need these. Is that correct? I think so, Doug. How about you? I agree. So the simplest thing would be simply to remove the requirements uh, under um, section, let's see, that would be 3404B sub 2 and 3405B sub 3. Yeah, I think I think one one thing we'll want to follow up uh, with that. I mean, that, that that was my train of thought from before. And uh, I would like to ask Mike before uh, at some point uh, whether he thinks 
given the details we know about this, what's in front of us right now, if there would be problems with zoning outside side of the PUD since well that that'd be a good thing to know so yeah my thought is as far as I know the answer is that there aren't other issues I mean we have to keep in mind at our level at the Planning Commission we're we're talking about writing the rules of the game so we shouldn't really be looking at this as approving or not approving this project and more looking at it you know um, from the perspective of we we have some rules and these rules were written with uh, some framework in mind and you know and now as we start to apply these rules we realize maybe that the rules aren't achieving the goals that we want and I think that's what that's what we really need to be making sure we're, we're keeping in the back of our mind it's not whether we think this is a good idea for Sabin's pasture, not a good idea. This is a, a, a the design we want to see or not want to see. Um, they're going to have to go through um, to get certain waivers and approvals from the development review board. There's, they're going to have to look at some requirements uh, for the for the subdivisions. Um, but really, the, the question comes down to what rules do we want them to have to meet? And, and that's why this conversation about what rules would have to change uh, is important. It's important so we can understand our how our zoning that we write impacts developments in the real world. Um, like the parking under the garage. We can't have a garage door that's flush with a building, then that means um, it makes it extremely difficult or impossible to build this um, to where the access comes in from the road to go under the building. Or to have buildings oriented to the street would mean having each one of these buildings square to the street, which means the benefits of the, the, the slope and using the slope as part of your design, you wouldn't be able to do. Um, maybe that wasn't considered. And I don't think it was considered when these rules were written. They were kind of thinking about maybe a project on Barry Street where we would want those buildings to face the street and um, you know, kind of be there, but that's a flat. Berry Street is flat. As soon as we start trying to apply those rules on a steep hill, they start to fall apart a little bit, make things more difficult, or make a design that's less desirable. Um, but that's that's what we should keep in the back of our our mind is um, how we want to write the rules. And just as a reminder, I guess the second point was just to remember back when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, one issue is that, you know, when we wrote these rules, we talked about um, providing density bonuses. And so if people wanted the added benefit of density, then you are going to have added responsibilities for design. Um, the way things kind of got shifted when they were approved by the city council is it was kind of all put into the, the higher density zoning district. Um, so it kind of made it where the development on this project doesn't need the density bonuses, but they're still gonna have to meet all the additional. So they're gonna have to meet the, the requirements they would have to meet. There are design requirements they're going to have to meet. Um, there are a lot of standards in the subdivision that they're gonna have to meet, um, but these PUD rules were written above and beyond what are the regular requirements. You're going to have some additional requirements to meet in order to get a, a density bonus, but it's a density bonus they don't need. So they have no, they have to meet all the requirements without really needing any of the benefits. So I guess that those would be the two uh, umbrella conversations I would put out there. Um, and then we could get into the specifics if people want to get into the specifics of what Doug had laid out for changing some of these. Um, I'd like to I'd like to second uh, what you're saying, Mike, and just for the record that uh, our concern is with the overall policy. Um, I've asked some questions so far to try to get a clearer picture of things, but yeah, for for the sake of the record, it this is to make sure that it fits within. Uh, the, the entire zoning scheme of things and to see how this project fits into everything uh, 
for us to learn. But um, as far as any decisions we make on this, it's definitely going to have to do with, um, you know, what's right for the city and um, not connected to this project. And that's, that's, I don't think that's where our heads are at, but we should articulate that. So thank you for pointing that out, Mike. Um, okay. Uh, so, so I agree with every, everything that Mike has said. Um, I would, I've been trying to get some more involvement from the planning commissioners though. So if we could, uh, if anyone has any questions at this point, now that you've seen the layout, now that you've heard what's in front of us, um, so Kirby, I'll, I think Mike, there was a point that you made that is relates to what I was thinking. I'm looking at the zoning map uh, and thinking about the everything that's within the PAD that's related to street frontage, and I'm absolutely thinking about Barry Street. So it was helpful to see that we're we're talking about a different road. We're not talking about Barry Street, but I think those rules make a lot of sense when you're talking about Barry Street because that's that's the main artery. Uh, that people are driving and we're really we're talking about creating a little a small residential street off of Barry and I so I, I definitely see the point that the rules in some sense are, are speaking to Barry and not to that to that residential street and I think so is this are we just talking about the little corner in the zoning map it's not little but the little corner that's in um, Riverfront yes. That's all within yes. that this, the, the development, the road will reach the rural lands at the top, but there's no proposal at this time, um, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the proposal, because most of what is being discussed at this point deals with the, the, the TIF, what we can do within those um, building new streets and utilities, those can only apply to lower area. And so I think um, even if this, even if there were something up there, I think the phasing of the project would be that you'd build the lower section. And if 10, 15 years from now, there's, there's a demand and available density that could be built in the rural, then I think we would be having a different conversation about that. But the proposal at this time is just for the lower portion, which okay. is 15 acres is the, the zoning acre rough, roughly. Okay. The, the other thing that I'm thinking about with that split between the green is rural, correct? On yes, the map, the, on the zoning the rest, map. The rest of Saving Pasture. Um, I, I, it feels to me like, I think we talked about this a little bit last time. It feels to me like that's the, con that's the piece that is being conserved on this parcel in terms of a lower density. And I would, to me, the riverfront district should be dense. We should be encouraging density. So the the requirement that they maintain 40% open space does seem a little strange to me within that riverfront piece when really that open space is what's in that rural savings pasture behind that parcel. I would, I would encourage, I would think that from my perspective anyway, we would be encouraging more density within riverfront and not less. Yes, as, as far as I recall from our previous discussions of the Planning Commission, is, is I don't think we ever envisioned specifically that the Berry Street and Savings Pasture would be a new neighborhood PUD necessarily. Like like it was an option, but not something that we were we thought was definitely going to happen. Um, but as, as Mike said before, the some of the requirements related to these PUDs were added later. Um, do we have any, do we have any other questions about this? Mike, do you, do you have from a, from administrative perspective and from a technical pers uh, perspective, do you have a preference for how this can be resolved? And when I say resolved, I just mean, um, you know, potential changes or proposals that we could make uh, to, to make the development of savings fit in with our city plan like we like we all have envisioned? So I guess I would say there, there, are, two, uh, there are two buckets to look at. Um, one bucket is to go through and say the, the zoning rules 
the, the applicability, this goes back kind of the discussion we had two weeks ago, which was that, um, you know, we ended up uh, through the, you know, the planning commission didn't uh, propose the, the entire parcel to be low density with these incentives to get density bonuses to cluster them in the lower and to, if you did the clustering, then you would, you know, have to conserve 40% and that 40% would be up in the up in the area that's now zoned rural and we would be able to get the development down there that we want and using incentives instead the the city council kind of did both they they left the pud requirements in um and then also went through and, and changed the zoning such that there was high density in the bottom and low density at the top which is what's really kind of causing the conflict at this point so one option is to do what we talked about last time, which would be to basically sever the the requirement that they have to go through this to put it back in the things. Of, if you want the benefits, then you have to do the additional requirements. That would be one way of of fixing the problem that's before us. The other bucket would be to kind of follow through what Doug has proposed, which are a number of going saying, well, if we've got to go through this and we're going to be required to go through this, we're going to need adjustments to these rules. The, the cost benefit on that is, as we make changes to these rules, these are gonna affect other parcels that may also have the ability to use a new neighborhood PUD um, where we might want these requirements and maybe somebody's going to come in and take advantage of the density bonuses, but now they don't have to meet the, the, the additional design requirements, um, which was the spirit of it. The spirit is, if you want to build to a higher density than is allowed, we're going to do that. We actually encourage that. But if you do, we're going to make you meet a higher design standard. Um, and if we soften the design standards, then we're going to end up with somebody who could come in later on with the idea that I'm going to get all the density bonus and I'm going to find ways of avoiding having to meet these higher design standards. And I, so that, I don't know if there is another project out there that, that can have this, but I think those would, those would be the two buckets we can look at. Um, and they're kind of costs and benefits of each one from a policy standpoint. <clears throat> and I can give my two cents, but my two cents really don't matter so much. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, as, as you may be able to tell, I mean, I'm, I, I don't see requiring a PUD as, as great policy. I, I haven't all along. If if we weren't, if we were going to try to alter the PUD instead, though, and still have it be a requirement for certain projects, then um, I think I think that there's at least there's room to put in some caveats for adjustments related to topography and things like that without actually just completely you know gutting some of these requirements because some of these requirements are obviously beneficial um and so, so just removing them um i mean when you change something from shall to should i mean you really may as well remove it uh by the way i mean you know that's that's my perspective um because it's only there for to cause trouble basically at that point um but um yeah, so so I, I think there is some room to to you know to adjust adjust these. I mean, what, what do the other planning commissioners think? I mean, there's removal, there's trying to adjust it, there's do nothing. Ch Chair, may I please say something? Uh, sure, Alan. I was going to say, um, I, I certainly believe in a PUD, and I think it really makes sense in the areas that the city feels it should. We just felt that the city's intent was to not have a PUD in this kind of density area called riverfront development. In fact, if you go into urban one, two, and three, we are encouraging similar kind of growth. A PUD is not applicable. That's why we thought it made sense. I do think a PUD does make sense in, in, the, in the less dense areas so that we can achieve what the community wants. I just wanted to say that. You know, it's it, it just a PUD is a tough thing to do in an urban area. And even though it's called rural, you know, excuse me, even though it's called the riverfront development, it's really like sort of like urban, urban four. And we have urban one, two, and three. And I was just going to point that out. Thank you, Chair. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my honest thoughts about the PUDs as they're in the zoning is that uh, the incentive to use a PUD is based off of density bonuses, but I don't think that the Montpelier market uh, is is one in which density bonuses are all that relevant or helpful. So I feel like that was a flaw and I've, I've kind of felt uncomfortable and like it was a flaw all along, if I'm honest, when, when we've talked about those. There's just not, a, I don't think in this market there's enough incentive to try to get that density bonus. So, um, you know, I think we need to to add more incentives to our PUDs if we if that's what we want as a city to, to you know, then, and, and, and added to that, there's only a few locations you can put a PUD in uh, that's, you know, walkable to downtown like we really want to see. Um, so I think we need to rethink it. But, uh, you know, those are my thoughts. Uh, planning commissioners, do we have any other thoughts on this? In anything? <laughs> can I just clarify? So the question before us is whether we want to take action on removing requirements under 3404B2 and 3405B3. Is that sort of the question we're I just want to clarify. That's one possibility. And, and but the, the second part, the, thir the 3405, though, it's, it hasn't come into uh, this discussion very much because uh, there's not a proposal on the table right now to develop in the rural area, which is what the 3405 would apply to. Is that correct, Mike? Uh, correct. Um, that's, that's true at this point. So, um, but at some point it does have the same, some of the same issues. So, um, I, I think at some point we would have to have that conversation, whether it's now or whether it's, you know, a year or two in the future, there are still some issues that are there that should be, should be addressed. But specific to this project, as we're looking at it today, it really is the new neighborhood that is the, the, bear, the issue at hand. If I may, um, you know, I, I think our, our position would be if you're going to revisit, if you're going to visit one, it, it probably makes sense to visit two in, in part because if you don't, um, it may cause future planning commissions to question why they didn't remove the second one um, when they did the first one. Um, and, you know, the reasoning, I think, is, as you pointed out, uh, Kirby and Mike, this is not a review of this specific project. This specific project is highlighting issues that are general uh, applicability. Um, and I think that both of these mandatory requirements um, you know, the reasoning is largely the same, that if somebody wants to develop in these areas and take advantage of the PUD, that's one thing. There should be a mixture of carrots and sticks in any PUD, um, but forcing all development through these PUDs, you know, creates these limitations that are unintended uh, for this type of development. And so I, I think it would make sense if, if the Planning Commission is headed in that direction to you know, um, make these PUDs um, not mandatory, but um, elective, then uh, it probably makes sense to, to take both of them because they, they sort of do fit together. Um, and in a project like this, while there's no rural development that's on the table right now, it's clearly intended in the future that there will be some rural development. So, you know, it's a question of do we, do we tackle it now or do we tackle it tomorrow? Um, and so I think it would make a certain amount of sense if you're headed in that direction to just make that sort of clean sweep that way. We don't have to deal with this in a piecemeal fashion. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And, and Ariel, does that answer your questions? Um, I have to be honest and say, sorry, it's hard to do these Zoom meetings at home sometimes. Um, <laughs> There's a gymnastics competition going downstairs, but um, I, yeah, I, I'm having, so I guess the question is just an overall look at the PUD regulations. I'm just not exactly, we're just considering whether we want to make changes to the overall PUD. And I guess, yeah, I mean, what would be helpful for me is just to hear from other commissioners who are understanding it better, like what your position is, I guess, would be 
very helpful for me. <laughs> so it's 3404B is the new neighborhood. What was the other section? 3405B. Thank you. All right. Uh, Aaron or Marcella, do either of you have anything? No, I'm just, just kind of just kind of listening right now. I'm pretty agnostic, frankly, right now. So, okay, um, I didn't I didn't hear Marcella, but it sounded like a no. Yeah, sorry, I'm um, just trying to understand what like all of this was pre before my time. All of these standards, so I'm trying to just. That it was helpful to hear what the intent was. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm fine. And chair, if I may emphasize, when we suggest or somebody suggesting maybe not using PUDs, um, we're always suggesting in the Riverfront District where it's a very important part and zone that you know it's it's been thought out that we really wanted growth in that area. I'm not trying to suggest, like I am the steward in the land of Crestview, I'm not suggesting that there shouldn't be a PUD or potentially that format for a different kind of parcel. Um, it just seems like if, you, if you're in the riverfront district, it just seems like that's a pretty tough standard. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's an okay segue for, um, I, I don't know, do, do the people think it would be beneficial for Mike to explain some of the you know, normal zoning requirements that uh, development on Berry Street would have to follow? Uh, is that something that we want to uh, talk about? Um, well, yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused because I thought you were saying PUDs were not required there for you. Sorry to be honest about my confusion, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. There's, there's, yeah, there's been a lot. So, I mean, to, to kind of frame this, there's, you know, PUDs are sections in the zoning that have their own set of requirements, uh, and they're supposed to come with certain benefits. But there is this this provision that says, you know, this, uh, a certain developments that are that are 40 units or more must follow these added rules, and uh, you know, a lot of them are design related, and 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 they're, you know, they're more strict than our other zoning but of course we do have our own all, all of our other zoning that applies to that district all, will also apply to this uh so it's a lot of regulation um and in it's in this situation and the way that it's written right now if people if you're building a, in uh 40 units or more then you you can't opt in to get the benefits you're required to follow these rules uh so it's kind of a question is like, do we, does that what we want or do we think it's more in line with the, uh, the current city plan and where we're going with the city plan and with the other decisions we've made recently, is it more in line with those things to say that, uh, you know, we're going to relax these restrictions. We're going to, of course, the PUD is still useful to have on the books because for a specific kind of project that wants higher distant density, it might make sense for it to follow these rules. Uh, or if we do think it's a good idea for 40 unit projects or more or greater to have to follow these new neighborhood uh, PUD rules, uh, if we decide that that is what we want, then the question is, do we need to adjust them though? Because it's been brought to our attention now that they're uh, too rich in some places. And for instance, there's some places where it seems like it doesn't take topography into account at all. Uh, so, you know, those are, that, that's, you know, the, the general framework in front of us. I also I take Alan's point about the specifically which districts are, are included. So the conservation district uh, applicability is to residential 9,000 and residential 24,000. Um, the new neighborhood is riverfront, mixed use residential, residential 3000 and residential 6000 and 9000. And I think another way we can look at this is, is through that lens of which, which zoning districts does this actually make sense in? And if we really do want density in riverfront, which I think we do, 
and maybe this is some of these rules might make a lot of sense for that, but I'm not sure that all of them do. I think I think part of the unspoken history here, though, Stephanie, is that when when Stephen Pasher was discussed about being developed before, people were really concerned about open space. Yeah, I just I think that the issue that Mike brought up with what the the city council decision was to put the rest of Sabin's pasture in rural makes it those two things don't work together. So, so having that requirement in Riverfront when that's just that little sliver doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, good point. So there's we're still conserving most of the rest of the parcel because it's in rural even if there would be some development that's that is allowable that could take place in that rest of the parcel. Okay, so if we if we don't have any more questions for for every, for um, our guests uh, tonight, then it, it I'm not it's I, it seems like the planning commission is not very decisive right now on this and might need some time to think. So uh, I'm I'm tempted to just kind of table the discussion to a future meeting. Uh, where we can talk about these things some more after people have time to think, um, unless someone on the Planning Commission has other thoughts. If I may, I do have a, a question for Alan and Doug. Um, that's not, that's about a different zoning provision, not this particular one. I don't, I don't want to close out the this agenda item, at least, before I have an opportunity to ask them. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Doug and Alan, you had previously mentioned to me a concern about <clears throat> the uh, footprint limitation in the Riverfront District. Um, if I recall correctly, um, it has a maximum 5,000 square foot footprint. Um, can you explain that concern? Why is that an issue? I, I'm happy to do it. Um, if we're trying to create the kind of the, the quantity of housing that you're speaking of, um, that just really makes us go vertical because of the site. Um, I've been designing and planning my whole life like you, and I really care. Um, that would be, you know, that would sort of force us into peds like structures sticking out of the hill. When Doug and I envision much more, a larger footprint, and I think there is a waiver that lets, that lets us go up to 18,000 square feet. Um, but we envision something that might meander and take advantage of, of the slopes and the terraces very much in a Frank Lloyd Wright-esque, um, where you take advantage of, of, the, of the topography and not just ignore it. And so that's where the footprints became kind of hard. I own Northwood Village next to Goddard College. Uh, each one of those buildings is a 5,000 square foot footprint. I get nine units per building. It's an eight acre campus, basically. And so I, I'm just trying not to build peds like structures on a hill. We'd rather build something that's creative and is designed well, and we appreciate all the comments that Mike has made and others about the difficulty of the terrain and how to get to it. We want to use um, our architects to really take advantage of that topography. So that's why we didn't want to be so limited to just a 5,000 square foot footprint or 6,000. So if I understand what you're saying correctly and your reference to Frank Lloyd Wright, Part of that is you're envisioning something more horizontal and you know not as vertical as would be to get the density. Yes, that would make us both a lot happier uh, in our in our appreciation of downtown Mount Taylor. Okay. And so, Doug, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming you feel the same way, Doug. Exactly. Well stated. Thank you. So I guess I can provide some comments. So there is, um, so the waiver provision that's allowed for footprints is actually unlimited. And there was a very specific conversation that we had in dealing with uh, this, this district itself, the, the Riverfront District, when we were at the city council. And um, the, the issue that had kind of brought this about was people, some residents in town were concerned that some folks were going to come in and as we had kind of matched our zoning districts to the densities that you find on the ground. So we did a very good job of kind of calibrating our zoning to make sure that 90% of our neighborhoods met their own zoning requirements. And, and that increased the zoning densities allowed in, in our, many of our neighborhoods. And the concern was that people had was that maybe somebody would come in and tear down some of uh, these buildings and build large buildings, you know, um, 
make these mansions by tearing down neighboring buildings and there was a concern. So they wanted to put footprint requirements in such that, you know, a neighborhood of, of 3000 square foot homes, you couldn't go in and put a 6,000 square foot home. And so we had a lot of conversations of, okay, so we found what the 90% was for footprints, um, looking at the assessor cards. Um, so we had a pretty good idea of what that number was, but in the end, um, we came up and had some tricky ones like Riverfront. What are we going to do with a place like Riverfront that, where you have a lot of Berry Street properties where the footprints are smaller, but you also include in that Granite Shed Lane and Stonecutter's Way where the buildings are much big, bigger than what you see, but they're in the same zoning district. And so the decision of city council was that we're, we shouldn't put a cap at all on it. So at first we thought maybe double or triple, um, but what city council eventually came down, which is on figure 3.06, um, if you wanna look it up at some point, Alan, is that's where the footprint um, requirement says there's no max limit to a, to a waiver request for a footprint. So you could go as big as you want. What the development review board would look at is the impact of that building on the character of the neighborhood. So a really large building in and amongst a lot of smaller buildings might not get approved, but a larger building, you know, for example, I'm not saying it would be because it's a development review board decision, but these buildings are set back from the road. Um, yes, Asia Drive is, is the private drive going in there, but it's really set back from Barry Street. So a larger structure is not overwhelming the buildings on Barry Street or across the street from Barry Street uh, over across the street from Sabin's Pasture is um, Caledonia Spirits, which is a much bigger building. Um, so again, when you start the application that would go in and the development review board would look at the character of the area, would these larger buildings that would be smaller than Caledonia Spirits negatively impact the character of that section of Barry Street? Um, I think there's plenty of room for a, a fairly good argument that um, these buildings would qualify for a waiver. Um, I certainly could see our good, good cases that could be made. I can't tell you they will automatically get approved for that. Um, that would not, I, that wouldn't be good for me to say that, but I think there are good arguments there that could be made. Um, and those would have to be addressed with the development review board to go through and say, look, the, the limit's 5,000 square foot, we're gonna be doing 15 or 17 or 18 or whatever number you're coming up with to go through and say, and here's our design. And I think that's what you would probably bring to the development review board because, um, you know, I think Kirby had mentioned this. There are a number of other zoning requirements. PUDs aren't the only ones. There are subdivision requirements. They're going to have to meet major site plan and major site plan would trigger the architectural standards. Um, so even though they're not in design review, they do have to meet architectural standards. So we're going to need to see building elevations. And I think what they, what the applicants would be doing is presenting an entire package that goes through and says, here's how this worked. Here's why a waiver is appropriate because it's not going to impact the character of the neighborhood because the character over here is different than the character on the other end of Barry street or, um, uh, some of the other places. So I think there are a number of good cases that could be made. Um, but the, the waiver could be a big, it could be a 300,000 square foot. You're just going to have to justify how it's not going to have an impact on the character of the neighborhood. Um, obviously the bigger the footprint, the, the tougher the argument you have to make. Um, but that gives people a little bit of, of context of, you know, waiver is something they're going to have to go through. And so, um, you know, and then within the subdivision rules, as I said, they'll have to do major site plan. They'll probably have to do subdivision, which looks at capacity of facilities, the suitability of the land, the traffic, the dis configuration of the parcels, the design and layout of the improvements, um, including drainage and grade and width of roads. So there's a lot of standards, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, landscaping, parks and recreation areas, um, the character of the neighborhood and settlement patterns, renewable energy and energy conservation. They do have to meet some natural resource protection if there's some requirements in there. 
So it just gives a little bit of a sense of they will have to meet standards. Even if they don't have to meet PUD, they still have to meet all these standards. Um, the PUD was above and beyond what are in here. Thanks, Mike. Uh, okay, so uh, do um, do we have any, before we table this? Uh, do we have any other questions, or does anyone else want to to make any points for everyone to consider? If I may make just one point, I think um, by far the simplest way to approach this would be, in fact, to remove the requirement for PUD and to go back to what, in fact, I see in most. Um, uh, zoning ordinances, and believe me, I've read dozens and dozens, if not more than that, um, is that they are an option. You know, the, the applicant has the ability to choose whether to apply as a PUD or not in order to get whatever those benefits are. And I think simply removing the requirement, leaving, leaving the standards, unless you think there's some that are not good in any way, um, but uh, uh, removing the requirement that certain projects apply that way would be the cleanest thing. Thank you, Dan. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Well, uh, I think we'll, we'll end discussion there. It doesn't look like uh, the Planning Commission's prepared to act right away. Uh, probably wise anyway to, to think about this. So we'll, uh, we'll put this on one of our upcoming agendas and, and revisit the question. Uh, and, you know, feel free to, uh, well, I, I'll ask, I'll ask uh, the folks involved in the call now, if we put this on the agenda again, um, would you like to be invited? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I would think that makes sense. You know, the other thing that I guess I would offer as well is that if, the commission wanted to look at proposed language. I'd be happy to work with Mike um, to draft things that the commission could consider um, that would be acceptable to my client um, as as a possibility of exploring it. Obviously, putting sometimes it's when you when the commission is ready to get to that point to actually start to mull over the language. It might help to have a couple options in front of you. I think, uh, you know, I was thinking about that and uh, since, since there's this threshold question of whether we even want to keep the requirement, I mean, if, you know, I'd hate to see you work on a version of it where there's a requirement, but it's more flexible. Mm -hmm. That seems like a lot of work if we end up, you know, not even going down, you know, not even considering that path. Uh, but, you know, you can feel, feel free to, to do that if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make anyone have to do that that work uh, on the front end without knowing. Well, I think you know we're in touch with with Mike Miller. If there's uh, you know if the commission mulls this over and wants to give him direction, he can obviously communicate with me and uh, Alan and Doug. Um, you know, so we can obviously do that. I, I'm just thinking the most productive use of your time and ours going forward is, you know, if you do want to, you know, I, I, it, it, we can certainly be available to answer questions and we can be available to, to run things through. But, uh, you know, at some point it, it always helps once you start to do that. If you do go down that road, as you point out, um, of either tweaking some of the, the intricacies versus just cutting out required language um, you know, we can certainly, we can certainly help with that. And that might be a good use to have, have those proposals if you go in that direction. Sure. Yeah. Feel free to do that if you'd like. Uh, I mean, it, it, if you don't want to do all, all of the work of, of redrafting something, you, um, a list of the problematic provisions, I know Doug went through those already, but if we had those handy for a future discussion, that would probably be handy. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is Aaron, I was just going to say, at least something identifying um, sort of the sticking points for the parties would be really helpful and help inform our discussion going forwards. Not necessarily, uh, you know, draft language, but just so I have a sense of when I go back and review this, I know exactly where everybody's looking. This would be very helpful. So thanks. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. Well, with that, we'll uh, we'll see you all in the future sometime. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you coming in and explaining everything to us. Uh, and uh, so, so thank you, thank you all. Thank you. I look thank forward you. to the next meeting. Good night. Thank you all very much, Doug, and I. Thank you both. Both. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Dan. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, the the next item on the agenda is to talk about the transfer transportation plan. Uh, what are our thoughts about that? Do we want to dive in with about twenty five minutes left? How are we feeling? Yeah, I'm not sure that I can <laughs> be of much use on that. Uh, with 25 minutes left, but I'm willing to do it if other people are game for it. I would not well, mind punting it to next week. Okay. Next yeah, I'm in the same boat, especially if Barb's on here and she's on the transportation subcommittee. So okay, that's a good point. Good uh, and I, I got some, uh, by the way, I got uh, contacted by the chair of the transportation subcommittee this week. Uh, some of their members might be interested in visiting us when we do discuss it. So heads up on that. And um, Hanif, Hanif is actually on on the line right now, who is and he is on the transportation committee. I don't know if you want to just get his his thoughts or if he was just going to be a fly on the wall. Yeah, Hanif, please uh, feel free to uh, speak up if you have general comments. Otherwise, you know, we're not planning on discussing it tonight. And uh, what I was about to say was, uh, we'll make sure that uh, everyone on your uh, subcommittee is informed when we um, discuss it next time. It'll, it'll, I believe it will be on our, our agenda for you know two weeks from now. Um, but we'll, but we'll directly send, uh, let your chair know. Are you there, Hanif? Okay. Um, Let me see if I can. Un I don't. I wouldn't blame anyone for zoning out. <laughs> so yeah, um, it, it, whether Hani or uh, somebody else, we'll just have to have them get me the who's the contact people. So if you're in touch with the transportation folks, Kirby. Yeah, I'll, I'll just get. Just let me know who who should be invited, and I'll make sure they're on the invitation list. I'll forward you the chair, and then and then. Um, and then we can have them tell everyone else. Okay, Constantinos. Constantinos. Constantinos and Hanif, that makes Montpelier actually sound diverse. Okay. All right, well, with that then, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Seconded. Okay, motion by Arian, second by Aaron. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Good night.